Hey everybody, Marco Nicolini with Grand Caliber, and today we have another episode of Under the Loop to share with you. This time we have five exciting watches to discuss, and real quick, I got a wrist check for you guys. Today I am wearing the familiar 16808 Tropic dial that I just bought. Love this watch so far, it's been great. I mean, you just can't get over that Tropic dial. It's absolutely phenomenal. So diving right into it, the very first watch we wanna talk about is the Rolex 16700. This particular watch is very special because it's not like your average GMT that you're used to seeing. You guys are most likely used to seeing a 16710 variant of this watch, which says GMT Master 2. What makes this watch really, really special is that it's not just a GMT Master 2, it's actually just simply a GMT Master. And not a lot of people realize this, but when you look at a GMT Master and a GMT Master 2, you might think to yourself, what are the differences? The biggest difference you'll know right off the bat is one is actually a quick set utilizing the crown while, while the GMT Master 2 is a quick set utilizing a jumping hour. So what that means is if you have a GMT Master 2, I'm sure you guys realize when you change the time, you can simply change the time normally, but if you need to change the day, date, uh, you would have to jump the hour. You'd have to do it in 24 hour increments to get that date to, you know, where you need it. It's kind of a modern day non-quick movement. It kind of sucks. It's kind of frustrating because you really have to move that hour hand. It doesn't take terribly long, but it is frustrating when you simply could just change the date like a date just where you just roll through the date wheel and you're there. That is what's so great about the GMT Master. It allows you to do that. Now, the only thing I will say, the biggest complaint is you cannot independently adjust the hour hand. So therefore you are strictly focused on the bezel. So the bezel has to be rotated to that time zone. Whereas you could just simply change it with the GMT Master 2. So there are pros and cons. This particular watch is a, is a very special watch. It's a 1998 U serial with the Swiss only dial. So that if you can look at the six o'clock from here, you'll see that it has just the word Swiss at the very bottom. You don't see Swiss made. You don't, you don't see Swiss T25, anything like that. You just simply see the word Swiss. And what that means is Rolex was going from tritium to Luminova to Super Luminova. So a lot of people actually say this is kind of like a mix. It's a Luminova dial, but it's not quite Super Luminova. When they're Swiss made, they have strictly moved on to Super Luminova. Therefore, there's no more tritium. Tritium has been discontinued by this point, And they have moved on from the material altogether because that material does have a shelf life. And this dial from 1998 still glows to this day. So that that move in Rolex eyes was was a success. Picked this up at IWJG at the, at the Chicago show and it is in phenomenal condition. It has been polished before, but very, very, very lightly. And it's only ever been polished by Rolex, which I will say Rolex did an excellent job as to not compromise the actual finish of the case and bracelet so forth. They didn't ruin the lugs. They didn't round them off. They didn't get rid of those chamfers. And it's been there three times, which is really unique. I actually have everything sitting here. I'll tell you what I'll do real, real quick. We're gonna take a quick second to pause this so I can show you just how interesting this is. Clearly this was a very, very responsible Rolex owner. Uh, he only serviced this watch through Rolex and it did come from Japan. The only sad thing about this watch, I must say, is the warranty papers have disappeared. I don't know why, as this guy had clearly kept up with the records of this watch. Um, it comes with the original booklets. And this is what's really cool about this watch. It is a 1998, like I said. And what's really cool is something I'll show you guys. If you look at the back of these Rolex, older Rolex books, and you look right there, it'll say 11.1998. So that is actually, these books are actually marked by year and by month, I guess here. So it's like November of 98. So it's more of a 99 too. I mean, some some later U serials are considered 99. A is the true 99. And it came with its booklets and it actually came with its Japanese counterparts. So you do have the original booklets that these are in Japanese and they're different styles. So this is just really cool. Cause like everything is completely in Japanese. I had to learn Japanese to understand everything. So, konnichiwa. <laughs> All jokes aside, I really did had to like translate this with an app. So it was kind of interesting. I was trying to see if like, hey, what, what what did they do to this watch? What do what do these invoices actually say? Because <laughs> it's clearly all in Japanese. The watch was bought in 98. Then it was serviced in 2002, which is four years, five years later, as they recommended. So back in the early 2000s, Rolex would say every five years you need to service the watch. And then from 2002, it got serviced again in 2010, and then again in 2020. So clearly a very responsible watch owner. 
The watch is in phenomenal condition. I'm very, very surprised Rolex did not replace that bezel. That bezel is definitely the center of attention here as that beautiful fade definitely gives this watch a very much 90s, 2000s vintage look and really gives the watch its own character set aside from a normal looking GMT. So there you have it, complete set, crazy, crazy set here. Sadly, the papers are missing. I hate to see that on a set like this because that's really the missing touch. But that's why this watch went from being worth, you know, it could have been worth 14 to 15,000, but you know, due to the missing papers, we sold it for 11.5. This sold very quickly. I did post it on my Instagram and it sold that same hour. I mean, when somebody saw the paperwork, they just went, holy crap, this watch has a lot of details to it. So it wasn't just a naked watch. You know, you could argue that in this case, or this kind of trumps the warranty papers in a sense, because you have so much recorded history with this piece, which is always good to have. You know, even though sometimes you find a beautiful watch, don't let the paper stump you. Sometimes there's alternatives to not having warranty papers. Maybe you have a full Rolex history service record to go along with your watch to show that it has only been touched by Rolex. And for the next watch, I have to say, this is a tremendous amount of watch for the money and a tremendously good looking watch to say the least. And something that I've been looking for personally, um, is an all blacked out watch. Cause I, I have a lot of watches that are gold, steel, so forth that I wear, but I never really had a watch that was all blacked out until I saw this piece. So this is the Apollo 8 Dark Side of the Moon Speedmaster, which was released in 2017, just shortly after they celebrated the 60th year of the Speedmaster. So it is a very, very unique watch. And why I have to say this is so much watch for the money is simply the attention to detail you're getting for the money is beyond a, re with beyond a doubt, probably one of the most detailed watches for the money. Just look at this. It is just absolutely astonishing. I mean, you can take a look at the dial, clearly a skeletonized watch from Omega uh, for a average market price under 10 grand is pretty phenomenal. You know, manual wind movement, the surface of the watch, obviously, as you guys would know and understand, it looks like the surface of the moon, which is really, really cool. So you've got craters and uh, really crazy textures and obviously, can see the inner workings of the movement on both sides and you get a chrono and not to mention the size of the watch. It's a 44 millimeter watch, but it doesn't wear terribly large. You know, you know I'm used to kind of wearing and seeing 44 millimeter watches such as Hublot's, APs and so forth that feel big on the wrist. This watch actually surprisingly does not feel very big on the wrist, rather it feels very comfortable and feels just a little bit wider than your average Speedmaster. And I must say it is an absolute comfortable watch to wear with this leather strap that is perforated uh, here so you could breathe. And another really amazing aspect of the watch is the attention to detail and the movement is just incredible. I mean, if you look at it, you really get a visual sense of how much detail Omega put into this piece. I'm really surprised the retail price of this watch wasn't much higher than it is. Just simply to, you know, just simply speaking on the movement alone and just overall detail, this is a ceramic case. It is not stainless steel, it's not coated, it is truly black ceramic and has a beautiful brush sides, which has that almost unique grain to itself. It's not a grain, a grain finish, which you would see with Rolex or anyone else. It kind of just has its own Omega feel to it. Doesn't scratch, obviously. Uh, biggest concern wearing a ceramic watch, of course, is dropping it. If you drop a ceramic watch, you are taking the risk of shattering the case, not just simply dinging it like you would a steel case. So you do kind of have to be a little more cautious wearing a watch like this. Um, but otherwise, like, I mean, it's just, you just get such a vibe with this watch, you know, just down to winding it. Just listen to that crunch. I mean, it, it's so satisfying. You know, I'm a huge fan of uh, manual wind movements as well. So this watch really speaks volumes to me in so many different ways. So, I mean, just listen to that. I mean, it's just a satisfying feeling. It's a satisfying sound. It's just satisfying knowing that you get to power up your watch every couple of days versus letting the automatic movement do that for you. And not to mention, you just get that really cool chronograph right there with the yellow hands. So it's very present on the wrist. My only complaints about the watch is the hands itself. Uh, they're very hard to read among that textured dial. They're, they are a little hard. I kind of wish they made the hands yellow. I think that would have been really cool with the sub dial hands being yellow. It would have been really, really cool to see a hour, minute and chrono hand also in yellow. Second hand in white is cool. I like the touch. I think it's very beautiful. They are hard to come by. I must say um, when I was 
hopping around different boutiques. I went into the Omega boutique asking about it and they surprisingly did not have it. They sell out very quick, so they're still very hot. Market price of this watch at the peak was roughly 16,000 to $17,000. I've seen some resellers asking up to 20 grand when these things were at the peak. And now you can have this watch for roughly nine to $11,000, depending on condition. This one being pre-owned in excellent condition, thanks to that ceramic case that doesn't scratch. Um, we would sell this watch for around 9,000. Speaking of budget-friendly watches, this piece right here is the 16523 Zenith Daytona, and it does not come shy. This watch has a lot of flair for what it is. This is the perfect entry-level two-tone diamond dial Rolex that's really going to stand out. This watch right here is a Zenith model, and it's one of the last Zenith models. It's an A-Serial 1999, and it does not come with boxer papers or anything like that, but it appears to be unpolished, but very much a worn watch, but very crisp and very tight. There's no flex in the band. And we are gonna have it polished up because this is the type of watch you just want it to look good. You know, this isn't a type of Daytona you wanna preserve and pass down and so forth. This is just a watch to really go out and look good, look the part, put it with a suit, put it with a t-shirt, go rock it out on a summer day. Whatever you wanna do with this watch, it vibes. Now, obviously being the difference between a Zenith and a non-Zenith is the movement. This is a, uh, actually it's an El Primero Zenith movement that Rolex has modified and they've actually slowed the movement down to operate at 20, 28,800 beats per hour versus the El Premier movement, which beats at 36,000 beats per hour, which is crazy high. It's a, it's, I think that's operating right around four Hertz, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but this one, as you can see, has a very nice bright white diamond dial and perfect watch to go for if you're looking for a really nice dress watch that does still retain some collectability to it. Um, this watch right here is, um, is the solid end links not the split band. So if you were to buy the same watch from a 1994, 95 example, you would have those looser, lesser than desirable end links that don't really hold well to a watch of this nature, especially on a two-tone model where gold is a little bit softer. It kind of shows more relevant on that. If you're really looking for the appeal of a Rolex watch, perfect watch to jump into. You've got diamonds, you've got gold, and you've got steel, and you've got budget friendly. This is a watch you can have anywhere between seventeen dollars to $21,000, depending on who's selling it. But for the sake of the video, I, we are selling this for $17,000 once we clean it up. It even has the original green sticker, um, which is quite rare to see. Obviously, the watch is in great condition for what it is. It's It's Looks like it's never been polished, which is really interesting. It is a little beat up per se, not terribly beat up, but as you can see there, the watch is, you know, the watch is free of dings, dents, and major scratches, just mostly a lot of hairline scratches you get with everyday use, but it looks like whoever wore it every day wasn't too rough on their watches. The bezel is nice, clear, and legible. The end links are still fitting good. You know, I, I see a little wear and tear on that lug there, but that could be cleaned up very nice. Um, but yeah, other than that, this is a perfect starter Rolex to dive into if you're looking to get into the brand and you just want something a little bit more flashy, a little bit more presentable. You're looking for more of that Rolex luxury appeal. This is a perfect watch to start with. While we're on the subject of Daytonas, you guys know me, you guys know I am a sucker for vintage Daytonas and especially steel ones. And what I have here, is the reference 6265 Big Red Daytona. This is absolutely a killer watch. Absolutely love this piece. And today I'm happy to share this one to you with you guys and we'll dive right into it. This is the watch that really started it all with Daytonas. The 6263 and 6265 really sparked the collector's attention when it came down to collecting watches. Probably one of the most hated watches at one point to probably one of the most loved watches in today's collect, you know, in today's world of collectors. They really do chase down condition, condition, condition with these watches because these are true assets. These are watches you can collect and put your money in the bank. These things are gonna be rising for the years to come. And especially when you have the black dial. For whatever reason, the black dial seems to be far more popular than the silver. I personally love the silver dial on the 6263 reference but I prefer black on the 6265. Something about the way they contrast just really pops to me. This watch utilizes the 727 Valjo movement, which is simply an ETA movement that Rolex has modified to work at to work at their specifications. You know, they've dressed it up. It's far better in their hands than it is as a Valjo 72. This movement started life with Rolex's 72B 
then it went to a 722-1, then eventually uh, made its way to a 727, which is the difference for where they're mostly playing with the beat rate of the movement. Um, they've sped it up a little bit. Super trustworthy movement. Uh, I have seen these watches not service for 20 years, still keeping really, really good time. And I've seen them just service keeping within a second. I mean, these are really, really great movements. So everything about this Daytona is all original except for one small detail. And that would be the crystal is a service replacement or possibly even a generic replacement. Some of them look the same, but I do plan on replacing it with a factory Tropic 21, which is the reference number from Rolex for this crystal code. Let's talk about parts for a second. So as you guys know, Rolex are very, very famous for these pushers and I'll break them down by part number so you can Google them, research them if you really care to. But these would normally come with P301s from the earlier variations from the 70s moving up into the 80s. But after around 78, um, they really switched to the P302. It's more of an efficient design for Rolex. They're a little bit more watertight. They seem to last a little bit better. And they're commonly even used to this day as service pushers. So if you were to see these same pushers on a 74 model, most people would have tell, well, most people would tell you that understand these watches that those are service pushers and they're not the factory P301s, which are just simply, uh, which are just very simple looking. They don't have this ridge there. They kind of just, tape off and there's no, you know, they taper off and there's no um, grooves or cuts into them. These have like a little groove at the very top. And obviously the 700 series crown is there, it's original. But otherwise it's all matching. It's in the correct numbers matching watch. And when I say numbers matching, we'll talk about that real quick. So the end links, a lot of the times the end links are, they're my biggest pet peeve. When I see these watches out for sale, it's never hardly ever disclosed but you should have 571 end links and they're very specific to Daytona and Daytona only. But what I'm used to seeing are 558Bs or 558s, which are simply off of a date. They're not off of a date just, they're simply off of a 19 millimeter bracelet from a date model, which is a smaller 34 millimeter date just basically. So they fit the exact same, they look the exact same. There's really no difference, but there's that pesky number that when you look at the back, it is not 571. 571 end links are very, very expensive for what they are. It's just a piece of metal that holds the bracelet to the head. Yet, if somebody has them, they're asking thousand, if not $1,500 for the set, uh, whereas 558s are a couple hundred bucks. The serial number and the bracelet code, luckily for me, they do match, meaning this bracelet wasn't replaced or added on there after the fact. So there's a clasp code here, which I want you guys to research. If you go to uh, Google and look up Rolex clasp codes by date, by serial, whatever you want to see, it'll sh it should show you that uh, they should show you a list of uh, class codes. It'll start with like V, VE. It'll go to D, and they're they're just simple letters, and if they will date the class to the year of the watch. So, in this watch's case, it is VE, and this is a 1980 watch. So if you Google it, you'll see that the year of the watch and the year of the clasp are matching with those end links. So that is a very, very good detail there to see that this watch is correct. And it has the correct style bezel. It's not a earlier 6239 bezel that was later added or anything like that. The only thing this watch really, really needs is that crystal. I mean, I'm very OCD about selling watches with incorrect parts. I hate doing it, but if somebody wants to watch as is, that's fine too. It's just simply a six to $700 crystal, but it's worth it for a watch like this. So that is the 6265 for you. They only came in black and silver dials. Of course, the very, very early variations did have the coveted Paul Newman dials, but you guys know those aren't gonna be very cheap. This watch price ranges anywhere between 70 to $100,000, depending on condition and completion and so forth like that. You could probably find an NOS one for probably 130 or 150, which is gonna run, you know, it would be a complete marathon to find one like that, but I get, I get requests like that from time to time. If you want a quick check on the condition, you'll see that it is pretty, you know, it looks pretty average condition. It doesn't look like it's, you know, over 30 years old or damn near 40 years old, really. Was it 43 years old, this watch? You can see the lugs are still nice, thick, and even. They're not over polished to a point which for Daytona's, uh, unfortunately, is a common problem. They get polished down and they kind of get their lugs 
file down to a point almost, but these are pretty nice. I'd say they're about 70%. These are not 20 millimeter lugs. These are actually 19 millimeter lugs. So with a Rolex date model, it's a 19 millimeter. With a Datejust, it's a 20 millimeter. So the Datejust bracelet would not fit. For a Datejust, it's a 78360. For a date, it's a 78350. So this does borrow the bracelet itself from a date model, but the end links are where the magic happens and the differences start to really separate themselves from that. So there you have it. That is the Rolex Daytona 6265. I hope you enjoyed this watch. I enjoy the hell out of this watch. Again, it's a favorite piece of mine. Love having these here in the uh, in the office and they're just a joy to have around. So there you go. Now for the next watch, you probably won't catch me wearing this piece. I'm not a huge RM fan, but I will say attention to detail is absolutely crazy, crazy killer with this watch. Even under a very powerful loop, this watch does not fail. It is the reference 6701 in titanium with factory diamonds. And I must say the diamonds they use for this are so small. They're little one pointers, they're tiny. They don't use crazy large stones for their settings. I mean, obviously if this was aftermarket, they probably would have used two pointers or something a little bit bigger because they really want to bring out that flex. But this is a very subtle flex. And I must say, that skeletonized dial just really goes well with that diamonds. You know, Richard Mill is absolutely known for their craziness and obviously for their market prices. Probably one of the most expensive watch brands in the world on average for their pieces. Um, entry level for a Richard Mill really starts around eighty dollars to $90,000 for pre-owned uh, Richard Mill 05. That is just ba a very basic, simple time watch. Um, I believe it has the date as well, if I'm not mistaken. But this one right here, has um just has the date and the time what's really cool about this watch is i'm sure you can notice right away you don't see the date wheel right off the bat you have to look for it but it's there that date window right there really shows off the date and it's kind of hard to see um but it says it's the 25th even though it's not is it the 25th Wait, it actually might be the 25th 26th, yeah. it's the 26th so it's a day off let's um let's fix that and i don't know if you guys just saw that but when i pull the crown there's a little lever. There's a little lever that indicates what mode I am. See, it just changed. Um, and I'll tell you what, though, and while we're reviewing this watch, I must say it is kind of a pain in the ass to change because every full turn only gives you about 15 minutes. That W means wind, and then if you go here, you're in the date function, and then here you're in the hour. So W D H wind date hour. I will say the action of this watch extremely smooth to operate. You know, obviously being Richard Mill, they pay a lot of attention to their movements um, and a lot of attention to their, you know, attention to detail. I'm trying to purposely not show off the back of the movement simply because I'm sure if you have an 80 relationship out there, you could respect the fact that people don't want these serial numbers out there. I mean, Richard Mill has a very, very, very tight knit operation. As you guys might know, maybe not know. If you ever were to be blessed and buy these watches at the retail prices, some of these models go extremely over the retail prices while some actually lose money. Not all Richard Mills are profitable <clears throat> outside in the gray market. Some are big losers as we call them and some are just lottery winners. <laughs> you might walk out making three, four hundred thousand dollars right off the bat, but they frown very heavily on people who resell their watches. They don't like it as you, I'm sure you guys know, Rolex, AP, Patek, Richard Mellor, probably the main four <laughs> companies that will completely blacklist you if they're caught, if you are caught reselling their watches. I know some guys out there that have been developing these relationships for years. And I will say that once they get to a point in that relationship, they start getting the bigger pieces. They start getting the 6702s. They start getting the 1103s, the Bubba Watsons and so forth, which have a great entry level price point for RM, but a astronomical resale value for the gray market. For the comfort of this watch, I must say Richard Mill really crushes it with the wearability of the watch for the 6701 and the 6702 line. I must say 1102, 1103s, they're just too big and chunky beyond my comfort level with wearing RM. But if I was gonna be wearing an RM every day, put me into a 6701 or 6702, preferably 6702 because they start getting a little crazier looking. You start getting the NTPT cases, which is that carbon, you know, with that very textured look. I mean, that is kind of what RM is really known for. They're not really known for their bust down watches per se, their factory set watches. I mean, don't get me wrong, I appreciate them. They look beautiful, but they are very innovative in a sense where 
they are mounting diamonds on titanium, they're mounting diamonds on NTPT and mounting diamonds on rose gold and so forth, which is very difficult process on some materials like titanium. It's not easy to work with. So the fact that they did it on this watch is just phenomenal. And, you know, I must say the orange strap is a nice touch. It is very plain and simple. It, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen RMs. I mean, you see they, they typically will have like crazy patterns in the straps, kind of give it a, you know, a crazy sport feel. But this one being a solid strap with diamonds kind of makes sense. You know, if you look at it, it's not distracting. It's not taking away from the presence of the watch. It's just being utilized for the watch in a sense. So very beautiful watch. Um, again, if you can see, I'm gonna put a side profile pic so you can see just how thin that is. This is not like RM. A lot of their watches are just so thick and they're very big and very tall. I mean, this is, I've seen RMs that are probably three times as thick as this piece. So I appreciate how thin this watch is. It means it fits very comfortable with a suit, fits very comfortable as a daily. Uh, and it just looks fantastic for what it is. I mean, it's very modern and slick. It kind of looks like something out of a James Bond movie in a sense, where like the villain would wear this watch while James Bond's attacking with the Omega, whatever. But very cool watch. That is the 6701 in a nutshell for you. Hope you enjoyed this segment. That's going to wrap it up for Under the Loop. I hope you guys enjoyed. Like always, please don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that bell. And until next time, thank you guys so much.